So Poincare recurrence is just the idea that if you have a classical mechanical system whose orbits in phase space are bounded, so for instance, planets orbiting around the sun, and it lasts forever, then you start the system at one point in phase space, draw a neighborhood around that point, and the orbit of the system will return to that neighborhood infinitely many times in the history of the universe. So it will return arbitrarily closely to wherever it started. It will recur over and over again. And this is true even for discrete time systems. Here's a, a nice example of a picture of Poincaré being mapped uh, under distortion a certain number of times and it becomes just noise and you keep mapping it and it becomes back to where you start. Again, it's not surprising if, if phase space is compact, you can't keep going to new places. If you last for a very long time, you're eventually going to come back to close to where you started. There is a quantum mechanical version of the Poincaré recurrence theorem that works if you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space or even if you just have a discrete spectrum in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So the relevance of this, this first appeared in uh, the early 1890s, and this guy Zermelo comes along. And Zermelo was thinking about entropy and the H theorem and Boltzmann's version of kinetic theory and his attempts to derive the second law of thermodynamics on the basis of kinetic theory. Zermelo later, of course, became a well-known accomplished mathematician, made seminal contributions to axiomatic set theory. In 1895, he was a postdoc. He got his PhD in 1894. And he started an argument with Boltzmann that went back and forth in the, in the pages of Nature. And I'm going back to the history because all of this stuff is still happening now with very, very tiny changes of vocabulary. So it's interesting to see what they were arguing about I mean, it's recurring. back then. It's recurring, exactly. It's a very short recurrence time. We're arbitrarily close. So Boltzmann in the 1870s had, he thought, successfully understood the origins of thermodynamics on a statistical basis. Before uh, Boltzmann and Maxwell and Gibbs and people like that, they knew the second law and the first law of thermodynamics, but they thought of them as fundamental laws. Boltzmann said, no, they're actually just statistical laws that are not autonomous, they're not separate by themselves. You can derive the second law of thermodynamics knowing that the system is made of atoms. If you understand entropy as measuring in a coarse grain sense the volume of phase space, that it corresponds to a set of microstates that are macroscopically indistinguishable, then of course the entropy is going to go up. If you start in some low entropy state, it's, there's not that many low entropy microstates. It will generically tend to grow. And he proved a theorem, the H theorem, that said under reasonable uh, assumptions, he could show that the entropy would grow with time. The second law of thermodynamics was true. Zermelo says, and you, can, you, can, you should read these papers because they're highly amusing. You can you know exactly what Zermelo is thinking. He's like, these are famous physicists, yet they don't understand that a function cannot be periodic and monotonic at the same time. <laughs> if you have a function of phase space, which is the entropy you assign to every given state by just coarse graining it, the recurrence uh, uh, theorem seems to imply that the entropy has to go up and down. It has to recur. It has to be quasi-periodic. But Boltzmann had a theorem that said the entropy will always go up. How can both of those be true? So Zermelo used this as to argue against kinetic theory. Zermelo was one of the people who didn't believe in atoms as late as 1895. He said, the second law is a law of nature. It is separate from Newton's laws of nature. It's another law of nature. And I've disproven your proof of it. Your derivation, your derivation can't be physically relevant because if it were, the entropy would go down just as often as it went up. So Boltzmann uh, responded to this, and Boltzmann understood what was going on very, very well. He had no misunderstandings, but he also had no scruples. So he changed his mind about what the correct response to this was many times. And you can't blame him because we still don't know the correct response to this over a century later. So he came up with several different responses, and they're worth looking at. I'm not going to read every word here, but just briefly. He said, well, maybe the universe has a beginning. This is 1895. He says, maybe what you would expect to be true from Newton's laws of motion is not true. Maybe time had a starting point. The second law would then arise. It could be explained mechanically as a result of Newton's laws if the universe started from a very improbable state. That's a possibility. And then, of course, you just get the second law. The other, another possibility is perhaps the universe is infinite. There is no recurrence because the orbits in phase space are not bounded. This is sort of the most obvious thing to think, and it is something that we still uh, should take very seriously. And I'm going to argue later this is my favorite version of this. In that case, the Poincaré theorem is just not applicable. But the final 
uh, response that he had is, okay, maybe all of your assumptions are right. Maybe the universe does have a finite phase space. Maybe it does last forever. Maybe there are Poincaré recurrences, and maybe we just happen to be in a random fluctuation in this finite-sized box of universe. And this is a long thing, but it's worth looking at. So if the universe is finite, if the phase space is finite, then there must be, so it's in thermal equilibrium everywhere and therefore dead. I like that. So the whole universe is dead. There's nothing happening. It's in thermal equilibrium. But because Boltzmann has explained the second law using kinetic theory, he knows that in thermal equilibrium, the second law will occasionally be violated. Very, very rarely you will fluctuate to a system, to a state, a configuration of lower entropy. So here and there, relatively small regions the size of our galaxy, which we will call worlds, which during the relatively short time of eons are going to deviate significantly from thermal equilibrium. So he's, he's talking about what we now call the multiverse. He's saying that in this really, really big region of universe, fluctuations happen where the local conditions become very different. And they're different galaxies. He didn't know that there were any other galaxies beside our own in 1895. He is advocating the possibility. He's raising the possibility that maybe this does happen. The Boltzmann's brain argument is an argument that, no, this doesn't happen because if it did, and that's the next transparency. Yeah, that's right. And he goes on and explains that you might think this can't be right because half the time the entropy would be decreasing and half the time it would be increasing. But he says that's not right because basically any person living in such a cosmos would always define the past as the direction in time where the entropy was lower. The formation of memories and the uh, and evolution and so forth all depends on the change of entropy. So as long as there is an entropy gradient in the universe, we always think the past happened in the past and we think the future happened in the future a posteriori. So the reason why this history is worth repeating is all of these are still alive and kicking as possibilities for what actually happens in the universe. And I would love to know which of these is true. So here's the problem with that last possibility. That last possibility is the one we're uh, looking at now. We're looking at a quantum mechanical framework, but it's still the same idea, some finite universe that lasts forever. The problem is that so most of the time you're in thermal equilibrium. If you plot entropy versus time, there's a maximum value, and you're usually just there. But there will be, statistically, fluctuations to lower uh, states of entropy. What Boltzmann didn't quite understand, he sort of intuitively knew it, but he didn't have the, the equations in front of him, is that the probability of a fluctuation goes as the exponential of the change in entropy. The more you lower the entropy by this fluctuation, the less frequent such a, such a fluctuation is going to be. So if you want to explain the universe around us by this kind of reasoning, you say, well, you basically impose the anthropic principle. You say, we can't live in thermal equilibrium. It's dead, just like Boltzmann said. Nothing ever happens and thermal equilibrium. So in order for us to be here, we need to have a fluctuation down. But that, that's a theory, and a theory makes predictions, like it or not. And the prediction is that you will be with overwhelmingly large probability in the smallest allowed fluctuation, where allowed means whatever you define allowed to mean. But once you define it, either it's just a galaxy, or it's just a star, or it's just me, once I define what I mean by anthropically allowed, I will predict that the overwhelming majority of observers in this thermal equilibrium universe are going to see just that, and the rest of the universe will be in thermal equilibrium. The first, uh, the first use of this idea that I actually have a reference for is Eddington in 1931, who says, the universe containing mathematical physicists will at any assigned date be in a state of maximum disorganization not inconsistent with the existence of such creatures. His, his slightly overblown way of saying you would see me, the mathematical physicist, and you all would be in thermal equilibrium. That's the strong prediction of this kind of uh, model. And then more recently, Albrecht and Sorbo reduced it to its, you know, the reductio ab absurdum, to the minimal thing you would ever need. And that's a single brain floating around in thermal equilibrium. So you have a set of particles with some Gibbs distribution or whatever it is, and they randomly come together to form a brain that is conscious and sort of looks around and goes, aha, here I am. And then it dissolves back into thermal equilibrium. <laughs> that's the anthropic cutoff. And you predict that the overwhelming majority of conscious observers in this ensemble are like that. That's the problem. That's why most people think that this model does not work.